Well, we welcome everybody here tonight to our midweek Bible study. Last week we had some problems on Wednesday night, so we did it on Thursday night. And what's interesting, I think, about all that is that we get so hung up in a certain way of doing things that we think if we don't do it on Wednesday night, we can't do it any other time, especially in this setup as things are now. So um, we welcome you to this study tonight, which will be the last part of our survey of the Minor Prophets. 12 prophetical books that are not major prophets because they are uh, shorter in content than those we know as the major prophets. We'll follow the continued pattern that we have with the other studies of the minor prophets. And I do want to do this for those who might be interested. Some of you may know this and some may not, but if you really want what I think is most thorough, accurate study of the Minor Prophets is available is by uh, Homer Haley, uh, the late Homer Haley. He's been dead quite a few years. He lived up to his 90s, but he produced a book that is one of the best I've ever read on a commentary on the Minor Prophets. So you might keep that in mind, uh, Homer Haley's Minor Prophets, a commentary on the Minor Prophets. Tonight, we want to look at um, the last three prophets. There are only three Old Testament prophets that are from the post-exilic period, and they are Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Now, the major prophets, Daniel and Ezekiel, prophesied during the Babylonian captivity. The remaining prophets performed their work prior to the exile in Babylon. I think I mentioned that last week. Now, about 16 years before the earliest of these prophets began his ministry, the first group of Jewish exiles came back to Jerusalem. You remember that Cyrus, King Cyrus of Persia, allowed Zerubbabel to lead about 50,000 Jews back to their homeland. And that was in 536 BC. And you can read about this in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. 2 Chronicles 36 and Ezra chapter 1. Ezra 1. Now I pause here and say that you do need to keep notes. You can go back to these uh, particular lessons after we're through with them because they'll be recorded. But for these uh, proof texts and other things, you might want to take notes or at least go back and review uh, when we're through with the lessons. Now, what happened when these exiles got back to Judah and Jerusalem? They began to rebuild the temple. But soon they became quite discouraged and they simply quit, according to Nehemiah chapter 12. Nehemiah chapter 12. And they got as far as laying the foundation. And then they just simply abandoned that work until the prophets Haggai and Zechariah came along. And in this particular lesson on these three books, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. We will see how that these prophets of God stirred the people to complete the temple and to renew their own personal religious devotions, which had also waned greatly at this time. The scope of the material found in these three prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, ranges from about 520 B.C. down to about 425 B.C. Now, keep in mind that these are the last prophetic voices to be heard among the Jewish people, Israel, the people of God, until the appearance of the forerunner of the Christ, John the Baptist. Now, with those introductory remarks in, remarks in mind, uh, let's look at the background of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. 
If you study commentaries about these people, you'll see that Haggai has been described as a man that had one single solitary ambition. He preached to a poor, discouraged, and frightened people. But here's what he did. He attributed their lack of success in all areas of their national life to the single fact that they had neglected the building of the temple. In a bold, frank, candid, in fact, quite authoritarian manner, he begged the people to rebuild the temple. Now he and the prophet Zechariah are actually credited with getting the temple completed in about 515 BC. Scripture reference, Ezra chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. Ezra 6, verses 14 and 15. Now, from the four dates that are given in the book, it seems that his ministry lasted only about four months in the year of 520 B.C. Agai chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1, and verse 10 also of chapter 2, and then verse 20 of chapter 2. I got 1, 1, 2, 1, 10, and 20. He started a work in 520 B.C., and some five years later, the fruit of what he started was realized. We also need to realize in studying these three prophets that Zechariah was Haggai's contemporary and thus a co-laborer with uh, one another or co-laborers with one another. Zechariah was born and reared during the captivity in Babylon and he was among the group that was returned to Jerusalem with Zerubbabel, Nehemiah chapter 12, verses 1, 4, and 16. Nehemiah 12, verses 1, 4, and 16. And the best we can tell, he seems to be younger than the prophet Haggai. And he continued his ministry for a year or so beyond the older prophet. If you read the book, and note how that prophet engaged his work, you'll see that Haggai rebuked and admonished the people. And Zechariah encouraged and pointed them to brighter days, all based upon their return to God and their faithfulness to him under the law of Moses. So their work was fully complementary and compatible. Now bring that over to the work of the church, spiritual Israel and the neglect of many members of it in seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, Matthew 6, 33. And you'll see then why Paul said, after he said preach the word, he said how to do it. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Well, that's what these prophets are doing, and I'll remind you that that's what I said about preachers needing to not stay gospel preachers, not to stay too long away from the prophets and learning how to preach to people. Some need encouragement. Some need to be exhorted. Some need to be reproved. Some need to be rebuked. And at one point or the other in the life of a Christian, all those things need to be done. As you personally study your Bible and in reading it and understanding it, God speaks to you then you can't tell me that as we study it, we don't see the same exhortation to ourselves or reproving or rebuking. And at times we read the Bible for comfort. And other times when we read it, we see the need to repent. Or at least that's the way it ought to be when we read God's word. When you look at Zechariah, you'll see that his work contains many visions. It also has a great deal of apocalyptic symbolism. Uh, remember, that's the kind of language you read of in Revelation and some in Daniel and in Ezekiel. It is the longest 
and some think the most difficult of all 12 of the minor prophets. We come to Malachi and we see that he was the last writing prophet to serve God under the law of Moses. The material that you find in Malachi parallels the situation that is described in Nehemiah chapter 13 and is generally dated in relation to Nehemiah 13. We find that the temple had already been built, Malachi 1.7 and chapter 10, or verse 10, Malachi 1, 7 and verse 10, and chapter 3 and verse 1. You also will take note in that book that the sins he denounces are the ones that were actually corrected during Nehemiah's work. And uh, that work followed a visit to Artaxerxes, the Persian ruler, in 433 B.C., if we go back and study the major prophets, you're going to see that some of these things overlap. So the book was written somewhere around 433 BC. This is almost a hundred years after Haggai and Zechariah. Uh, this prophet found the people had backslidden. They had reverted to their former spiritual laziness. They were a very indifferent people. That's not like anybody you know in this country. The priests were lax. In fact, they were just downright wicked. The offerings to God as prescribed by the law of Moses for the people of Israel were neglected. The family was in a bad shape. Divorce was a common thing. And justice, as prescribed by the law of Moses for the people, was simply perverted. When we look at Malachi, we see a man with intense love for God and the word of God and the people of God. And this drove him. It moved him to speak with great urgency in the streets and in the marketplaces. Wherever he found an audience, he would speak to them, telling them of their responsibility to God the need to repent of their sins. He used a style of teaching, and I've always found this interesting, that is known as um, didactic dialectic. And that's a big way to say a thing. But if you read about it formally in the study of speech, that's what it comes down to. He used that method, didactic and dialectic method. He, do, he does this in his writing to the people. Because remember, his book was written to the people as well as what he had to say uh, orally. Here's what happens when you follow this line, and you'll see it used a lot of times today. First, the speaker, in his case, uh, affirms something to be the case. He made an affirmative statement. Then... He knew the people would have objections to what he was affirming. So he would, before they could make them, answer their objections. He affirmed the thing. Then he began to answer their objections that they would raise. And the third thing is that he refuted their errors. You can see this. And I'll give you a number of scriptures here in Malachi that shows how he dealt in the didactic, dialectic method as I've just described it. Remember, this is the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 through 3, verses 6 and 7. Chapter 2, verses 10 through 17, and verse, uh, well, chapter 3, verse 7, 8, and uh, 13 and 14. So Malachi 1, 2 through 3, verses 6 through 7, chapter 2 and verse 10, verse 17, chapter 3, verse 7, 8, and 13 through 14. Now, for those of you interested in methods of teaching, and that's a good way to do it. Just state the truth and then deal with the objections. 
and refute them. Don't give them a chance to cause a big problem by offering them. Just as you teach, here is the truth. And here's what you may say about it and trying to reject it. And then answer whatever it is they may say. Think about this. If you're dealing with baptism and the plan of salvation, and you teach the truth and an affirmation that baptism of the Great Commission is a burial in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins. Well, you can think of all the denominational people that would try to say, no, that's not right. You're saved before baptism. But then you start bringing up their objections and then you answer their objections. So this method became universal, in fact, in the synagogue and in the Jewish schools of instruction. And as I say, it's still used today. The message of these prophets of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, there was a common message that all of them employed. And remember, they are working after the exile, the Babylonian captivity. And we can sum up their message by saying, that they were getting over to the people that you must return to the right ways of the Lord, the right ways being the law of Moses. You see how all of these, this being the last three we're covering, all of the minor prophets can be taken and looked at in the light of, or the other way around, look at the gospel system and the New Testament teaching and know that that's basically what we say to people today who would become Christians even from the standpoint of defining what a Christian is, where you find Christians in the Lord's church, what it is to worship God in spirit and in truth, and so on, in living the Christian life and in worshiping God according to his will. So people must return to the right ways as God defines the right ways. Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi led, or we may even say spearheaded a movement for restoration of the spiritual lives of all those who were with them at this time as they've returned from the captivity. Now, another important thing about these men, they didn't offer any new revelation. They appealed to the people to return to the truth of the law of Moses. That's the way the Jews approached God during the Mosaic period and to live according to what they had already had revealed to them in the law. The people, now that they're home from the exile, were then challenged to actually renew their spiritual fervency and zeal, their vitality of a theocracy, a covenant nation, a nation out of other nations, but a spiritual nation all of it being governed by the law of Moses. Now you'll notice that Haggai and Zechariah were specifically concerned with the rebuilding of the temple. Now what had happened is, is that the people had left off dealing with the temple, their enthusiasm waned. How did they spend their time when they ceased to build the temple? which was the center and core of their approach to God and worship of God through the Levitical priesthood under the law of Moses. Well, they started taking care of their own personal likes and dislikes, their own personal affairs. That's how they neglected the temple and other spiritual responsibilities the law of Moses laid upon them. I ask you at this point, have people really changed? You watch members of the church who aren't really zealous for the cause of Christ to sit out in the New Testament. And I'll tell you what they're doing. They're taking care of their own affairs and satisfying their own whims to the neglect of the Lord's church, its worship, and the work of the church. They've lost their love for lost souls. They've forgotten, in fact, that somebody loved them enough to prepare themselves to teach them the truth. So you can see that people and their nature really don't ever change. Malachi challenged this apathy, this laziness, this disloyalty of the people. 
And you also need to note that Haggai, as well as, well, all of the prophets to one extent or the other, but I think now even more specifically, besides Haggai of Zechariah, that he gave great encouragement to the hearers to keep on keeping on by remembering that the Messiah would come. God had always kept his promises, and he would keep that promise also. Poverty and hard times had come to the people, and Malachi recognized that in his work with them. You'll see that the people were actually questioning the love of God because of their difficulties. Does that sound any different from people today? And the prophet dealt with it differently from what they were. He was saying there's a reason that you're spiritually lethargic. is because you have not put God first in getting that temple built. You've, took care of, you've taken care of your own affairs. So it was the sin of the people. There has that, That's where the problem's always been, whether it was the patriarchal age and the people who lived in it, or whether it was the Jews approaching God or the law of Moses, or whether it's in the Christian dispensation and members of the church. If you neglect the kingdom and its work, you're not going to be all that you ought to be, and the peace that passes understanding departs from you. So he says that this is the real genuine basis or root of your problems. But you will look at it and see it for what it really is, but that's what you've got to do. Now, if you look back to Isaiah, he made it very clear that the same thing was true of those people hundreds of years before they went into captivity in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Uh, what keeps God from being all he's promised that he would be to any servant or one who claims to be a servant of God? our sins. He turns his ear from us. He turns from us. If you go back and read Deuteronomy, Moses tells the children of Israel before they ever go over under Joshua into the land of Canaan to take the land. That if you start doing what these people have done, I'll, I'll cut you off. Did he keep his promise? He certainly did. So you see the approach of these prophets in restoring things to the way they were before they went into Babylonian captivity. Now, there's one singular thing that needs to be noted. These prophets are not dealing with people who are running after other gods. The trouble Israel had with running after idols seems to have been completely burnt out of them by, by the Babylonian captivity. They weren't doing a lot of other things God says they ought to do as faithful children of Israel. But you don't see any of these folks talking about the idolatrous worship of the people who returned from the Babylonian captivity. Of course, there are major themes or issues in these books, as there have been in the other minor prophets. And one of them is so very true today, and it's dealt with to a great extent in the New Testament concerning Christians. And that is the danger of one's love for God and godly things growing cold the danger of one's love growing cold. I said earlier that when the exiles first arrived back home, uh, they were enthusiastic. They were fervent. They were zealous to get done God's will. Nehemiah chapter 10, verses 28 and 29. Nehemiah 10, 28 and 29. Sadly, that didn't last very long. People of God have often been a very fickle people. They flare up like you throw gasoline on a fire, but it only lasts for a little while. And this has always been a problem. And if you read your New Testament closely, you'll see, since most of it's written to Christians, that that's a problem in the church then when it was being written as it is today. So that their desire, their fervency to build the temple didn't last very long. And they got the foundation laid and quit. And then you find a, a cold religion. You find lax morals beginning. And when you look at all three of these prophets, they all face this particular problem with the exiles who returned from Babylonian captivity. Well, guess what? It's a problem that has to be confronted 
in the church of Christ. The last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, as he's dealing with the seven churches of Asia, he has to deal with that in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4, Revelation 2, 4. And then you may say, well, what's the cure for a cold love, a love that's no more vibrant, no more fervent? Well, chapter 2 of Revelation and verse 5 gives you the answer, Revelation 2, 5. And what is the first step? Repentance. That's the first step. You obey the gospel, you rise to the watery grave of baptism, you're fervent and zealous and you're happy and in time, sometimes longer with some and shorter with others, you grow cold and you need to repent. I want to remind you, though I've said it many, many times, that repentance is a breaking down of one's old stubborn will that is the seat of all sin and rebellion against God. And God breaks us down, if you want to call it that. We actually do it to ourselves. We do it in the light of proper information. Because we have been brought to sorrow toward God for our sins against him. No repentance is going to take place unless you're very sorrowful toward God for your sins against him, for transgressing his law, 1 John 3, 4. It's this kind of thing that works repentance and nothing else does. Then you can see the results of repentance by the reformed life. So when we close a lesson, a sermon, and we have the invitation, we mention what people need to do to become Christians, and then we speak to those who are children of God, and we urge them to recognize any sins in their lives that they're not trying to get rid of, not trying to turn from, and we urge them to repent, confess their sins, what we're urging them to do is be sorry toward God for the sins you've committed against him. After all, you became a Christian. You believe the gospel. You from the heart obeyed that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, Romans 6, 17, 18. The Lord added you to his church, and you rose from the watery grave of baptism with all your past sins forgiven, and you're a new creature in Christ. But all of that slides away. So there's a foundation, as it were, that's laid in a person's life, such as the Jews in the, returning from the exile laid the foundation of the temple, but then they quit and started taking care of their own personal affair. They grew cold. They grew lax. They ceased to care about the work that the God expected the Jews to get into. So they, in repenting, they, they must return to the basic things. That's how that you renew your first love. They have to do those things that nourish spiritual life, remove from their lives those things that got them into the mess they're in. They have to get back to a proper study of the Bible and meditation on their lives and the light of it. They have to engage in effectual fervent prayers. They have to engage in scriptural fellowship. They have to be involved in the work of the church, in faithful service to God, and in faithful worship of God in spirit and in truth. So the only question we can ask in making application of these minor prophets to the New Testament that pertains to us for people today approach God through the New Testament is to ask, what's the state of our inward man? Remember Luke 8, 15 said those that heard the word and it accomplished something with them had a good and honest heart. Well, you can lose that good and honest heart even after obeying the gospel. These people did. And they slip back into satisfying themselves. Well, that's what most of America does. And a worldly person is somebody who's interested in self, 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 and getting things done his or her way. These people did that, and they neglected what God said they ought to be doing as children of Israel. And then you get a picture of fasting, fasting. Before the exile, when you study the law of Moses, only the Day of Atonement was observed as a required fast in Judaism. The other holy days of the Jewish calendar under the law were feast days. Now, individuals 
might choose to fast as a sign of great grief, 2 Samuel 1, verse 12, 2 Samuel 1, 12, or how deeply repentant they were over a sin, Daniel chapter 9, verses 3 and 4, Daniel 9, 3 and 4. But now we're talking about after the exile. And after the exile, four other annual feasts, or fasts, I should say, four other annual fasts began to be observed. Marked down as a proof text, Zechariah chapter 8, verse 19. Zechariah 8, 19. Now, at some point in Jewish history, somewhere or another, they got this in their minds. The people began to think, that fasting would gain an automatic hearing before the Lord. Isaiah was dealing with some of that in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 and 4. Isaiah 53, 3 and 4. But Zechariah comes along and he stresses the very important truth that fasting apart from obedience to God's commandments and total surrender of one's life to God's will from the heart, a whole heart, is a useless thing. Zechariah 7, verses 4 through 14. And when you come to our Lord ministry and read of it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament, you'll see how he talks about how the Pharisees made a show of their fasting and that it didn't do anything for them because they weren't honest and they were not keeping the word of God. He said, how be it in vain do you worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Well, they could fast several days a week, but if they weren't obeying God's will, it did them no good. It was a mere pretense at show. So the mere form of godliness can never be substituted for its essence, obeying God from the heart, loving God with all that we have and are, and loving our neighbors ourselves, and again doing only what God's authorized us to do. Colossians 3, verse 17. You may have people who attend the worship and Bible study periods, but what do they do in their families and in their day-to-day -day activity? What about their language? What do they do in their dealing with people? How do they take care of their obligations to society? Do they practice loving their neighbor as themselves? You see that the heartache of unjustified divorce and remarriage rears its ugly head, as I intimated earlier. And it's important here again to note that both the Old and New Testaments permit divorce and remarriage in one extreme case. Let me give you what's said by Moses in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 24, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. And then notice what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 32, and Matthew chapter 19, verse 9. You'll see that God always intended for one man to be married to one woman until death do them part. The free practice of divorce and remarriage is the mark of one thing in a society. It's a mark of people turning away from God. Now, I couple that with the acceptance of homosexuality and all the other sins of a natural kind and sins that are natural. And all of these put together say, these people don't want to retain God in their knowledge and they want to do their own thing. Some of the people of God who had remained in their homeland during the captivity period had actually married pagans, according to Ezra chapter 10, verses 10 through 12. And Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 23 through 31. But you'll know that in Deuteronomy 7, remember Deuteronomy means a restatement of the law of Moses. 
that in Deuteronomy 7, verses 3 and 4, that was forbidden. And you see the remedy of it in the days of Nehemiah as he sought to return to the law to govern every aspect of their lives. Well, after the return, you also see that some men, men began just to cast away their wives. Malachi chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Malachi 2, 14 and 15. But you also see God's severe attitude for all such tampering with a divine institution. Read Malachi chapter 2, verse 16. Malachi 2, 16, along that line. Then you come down to our day in our present situation of widespread disregard of the sacredness of marriage and who is authorized of God to marry. That needs to be addressed regularly. And when you strive to go out and teach people the gospel, you're going to run into a lot of people that are not going to repent of those sins, and you'll not be able to baptize them into Christ because nobody's baptized properly for the remission of sins if they have not repented before they're baptized. So we must be bold in preaching the whole counsel of God on marriage, divorce, or remarriage. And we notice these folks, these prophets, were restoring things to be done as the law of Moses said they ought to be done in Jerusalem and Judea. Well, today, if we're to keep Christianity the way God wants it, then we must preach the whole counsel of God and contend for the faith also, no matter how much uh, or how many people cast dispersions upon them, even our own brethren. Now, as we come a little closer to the end, we'll talk about breaking down each one of these prophets or these books of the prophets and see how they line out. We look at Haggai first. The prophecy of Haggai in his book consists of four, four messages to the returned exiles. It's interesting that the first is a stinging rebuke of the people. And it, Again, is what I've been saying. It's because they sought to establish their own prosperity by neglecting spiritual responsibilities. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. It produced repentance, according to chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. And then we notice that the second was designed to encourage the people to encourage those who had engaged in rebuilding of the temple at Jerusalem, chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. The third one of these, recall that sin and impure hearts had brought punishment on them in the past, chapter 2, 10 through 14, and then promised that obedience and pure hearts would bring divine blessing, chapter 2, 15 through 19. And the fourth one is a messianic prophecy, chapter 2, 20 through 23. Now, when you look to the book of Zechariah, you can divide it into four sections. First, notice again how they follow the same approach. There's a call for the people to repent. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Then you get into a series. This is the second point made or division in the book. A series of night visions. And these night visions have to do with the future of the people of God and his kingdom. I'll just mention these and you can jot them down and read in detail about them. Just remember they have to do with the people of God and his kingdom. He talks about certain writers among the myrtles, chapter 1, 7 through 17. He writes about four smiths and uh, four horns, actually the horns before the smiths, four horns and four smiths, chapter 1, 18 through 21. Then he has a vision of a man with a measuring rod, measuring line, I should say, chapter 2, 
verses 1 through 13. Then he goes into the trial of this Joshua, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. He sees a golden lampstand and two olive trees, chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. And then a flying scroll, flying scroll, chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. He has a vision of a woman in an ephah, E-P-H-A-H, chapter 5, verses 5 through 11. Then a vision of four chariots, chapter 6, 1 through 8. And then he has a vision of the crowning of Joshua, chapter 6, verses 9 through 15. Third, there is a question about fasting that's raised in chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. And you remember what we've already said about fasting, but the point is made that fasting is useless without obedience to God's will, chapter 7, 4 through 7. We learn from the prophet that the Lord's expectations of the people are set out in chapter 7, verse 8, all the way through chapter 8 and verse 23. But then he reassures the fourth one, the people of God are reassured about the future. He makes it clear that the heathen nations will fall, chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. And then he speaks of the appearing of the Messiah in chapter 9, verse 8 through chapter 11, verse 17. And then he speaks of salvation being established in spiritual Israel, which is the church chapter 12, verse 1, through chapter 14, verse 21. Now, of course, we have the benefit of the New Testament teaching to see all these things in the light of the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. Those people at that time didn't. But they could see what God wanted them to see if they desired to do so. Remember, the law was a schoolmaster to bring people unto Christ, Galatians 3.24. And these prophets had their part in that too. Then look at the book of Malachi. Last book of the Old Testament canon. It opens with an affirmation of the love of God for his people. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. But then he shows how that the people had spurned his love. In chapter 1, verse 6 through chapter 2, verse 9. Then Malachi delivers a specific rebuke to the people of his day, of course, for their widespread corruption of marriage, chapter 2, 10 through 13. And finally, the prophet looks forward to the coming of the Messiah, chapter 2, verse 17, through chapter 4 and verse 6. Y'all just read that. Be a good one to read before you go to sleep tonight and see what beautiful language there is. The Old Testament closes. It closes on the note that the Messiah's coming and God's going to bring it about. Well, we finished with our survey of the 12 minor prophets. I hope that if you've taken notes and seriously considered this, that you'll sit down, open the books, and read through them word for word, verse for verse. And let these particular matters we've given you help get the picture formed in your mind of the people of that day and what God was doing through these prophets. There are many important facts and meaningful details that we couldn't go into in a survey situation, but with these skeleton outlines and main points and things like that set out that will help you if we'll just read the text now. In other words, there's been enough provided for foundation or a better study of these prophets. Now, I've been trying to think, what will we do if we keep going on as we are? And I thought, well, is there something I can say that will back up some things and reinforce and enlighten us to when, God willing, we're able to meet back in the building 
that will help us in our continued study of uh, geography, Bible geography. And I think, I'll, I've intimated this several times over a period of months, I think what we'll do in the time, however long that is, that we have in these studies on Wednesday night under these circumstances, that we'll look at the what we'll call the 400 silent years that bridge the Old Testament from Malachi to Matthew. This is a crucial period in history. So I think what we'll do next week, and we'll see how far we can get if the Lord wills, for us to be here and carry on, we'll just begin a basic survey of that 400 years that passed between the time that Malachi lived and the events that are covered in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So much did take place, and I think this will be a good time for us to do that, and I think it will help us when we get back to the Bible geography. So the Lord willing, then we'll study the 400 silent years between the Testaments. We thank you for being with us. Hope this class has been helpful. We'll see where we go from here. Let's all remember one another in prayer. Let's not forget our obligations to the church, especially our financial obligations. Uh, I see a lot of people, before I close, I'll say this, greatly concerned about the Lord's Supper. Read a lot about it on Facebook. I haven't seen one person, not one, raise any concern about their contribution. Strange, isn't it? Or is it? So keep those matters in mind while the work of the church must go on. Well, thanks for being with us. Have a good night. Let's all remember one another in prayer and pray that this COVID-19 virus will soon be done away and not a problem. Whatever we do, let's pray, not our will, but God's be done. Thank you. Good night.